Hello everybody. Today we're going to be looking at the last section of chapter 4, the section on conservation of energy. So if you've got your notes printed out, we'll go ahead and look at the main idea of this section. And um, uh, it actually won't take as long as you think to get through these notes. You'll see. All right, so the main idea of conservation of energy is that energy cannot be created, and by that I mean out of nothing. It can't just suddenly appear, nor can it be destroyed. So energy cannot be created nor be destroyed. Whoops, destroyed. There we go. I said it. I did it right now. Only transformed. And by that, I mean transformed into another form of energy. So energy can't be created or destroyed. It can only transform or convert from one to another. And it takes work to convert the energy. All right. So let's take a look at an, uh, a, a conceptual example here. All right. We're looking at a part of a roller coaster. And yes, my little roller coaster car doesn't have little wheels on it. So if you want to put little wheels on it right there, go right ahead. Because it certainly looks better with little wheels, doesn't it? Now let's take a look at the energies this has. When the chain mechanism of the ride brings the coaster car to the top of the first big hill, and you know how they do it. They do it real slow. They don't do it fast. They do it slow. And you know why? Because it builds up suspense. You know, oh, we're getting closer to the top. We're getting higher and higher. Ah! So anyway, once you do get up to the top, you're going very slowly, not very fast at all. So you only have a little bit of initial kinetic energy right there at the top because of this tiny little velocity. Okay, they're not going to take you up there fast. They're going to take you up there slow. And because you're very high up, you're going to have an awful lot of gravitational potential energy at the top. Now, the whole point of the ride is to come down the hill. Okay, but right here at the top, right at the moment, we have a mechanical energy here at the top that is made up of the little bit of kinetic energy that we have plus all of this potential energy because we're so high up, okay? Now, gravity is going to do work to bring the coaster car down the incline, okay? When we get to the bottom, I want you to notice that all of a sudden, our height is no longer as big as it was. So since the height is smaller, so is the potential energy. Here at the bottom, we don't have as much potential energy as we did before. So where did all this lost potential energy go because it can't be created nor can it be destroyed. So this potential energy that we lost was not destroyed. What did it do? It transformed. What it did it transform into? Ah, look at your velocity. Now it's really, really big compared to what we had up here. And as you know, Kinetic energy is associated with your velocity, with your speed. So because we now have a great big speed, we have a lot of kinetic energy down here at the bottom. So where did all that potential energy go? Okay, it was converted into kinetic energy. Okay, gravity did work to convert potential energy into kinetic energy. So now let's look at the bottom. At the bottom, we have a final mechanical energy. If we look at the two points, the top and the bottom, we had a mechanical energy at the top. Now we have one at the bottom. And it's made up of this great big amount of kinetic energy that we have now, plus 
the little bit of potential energy that we have left due to the small height that we have. And you know something interesting? Because all we did was take some of this and make it into kinetic energy, the mechanical energy at the top must still be the same as the mechanical energy at the bottom. All we've done is rearrange which of the two energies um, uh, are bigger and smaller. So instead of having a little kinetic and a lot of potential, now we have a lot of kinetic and a little potential. But the sum should be the same. And this idea that the mechanical energy at the beginning of the event, the event being coming down the incline, and at the end of the event must be the same, this idea is called the law of conservation, takes a minute to write out that word, of energy. Energy in a system cannot be created or destroyed, only changed in form. So, the potential energy wasn't lost when the car, car came down the hill. It was transformed through work done by gravity into kinetic energy. So the car went faster as it decreased height. Okay? Now, this means that whenever you're going to look at the mechanical energy of a system, you need to know that for any isolated system, that means any system where there are no external forces acting on the system, then the mechanical energy remains constant. And we can write it two ways. We can say the mechanical energy initial, that means at the beginning of the event, equals the mechanical energy final at the end of the event, or we can also write it like this. We can say the initial Ke plus the initial Pe, since that's what mechanical energy is made up of, equals the final Ke plus the final Pe, since that's what the final mechanical energy is made up of. Remember, mechanical energy is the sum of the kinetic and the potential. So the two sums, this one and this one, must stay constant at every point in time. So if you know one, you automatically know the other because it must be conserved. Now, let's take a look at this little example right here. It's not a big one, and it's a lot easier than it looks. Now, um, in many textbooks, they use an apple on an apple tree, but we live in Florida, so I chose to use a grapefruit on a grapefruit tree. So here's our grapefruit right here, and it is located six meters above the ground. And it says it right there. So I'm gonna call that the initial height, okay? Because that's where the grapefruit starts out. And by the way, notice we know the mass of the grapefruit. The mass equals 0.8 kilograms, okay? Now, what do we know? What else do we know about the grapefruit up there? Well, since it's stuck on the tree, we also know that its initial speed is zero. Okay, that's going to become important in a little bit. Now look what it says. It says it suddenly falls to the ground. So our grapefruit is going to come all the way down here and go split on the ground. And therefore, the final height is zero. And because it is moving when it strikes the ground, the final velocity is not zero, okay? So let's see what they want us to find. It says, determine the kinetic energy of the grapefruit when it reaches the ground. Well, now we know that the mechanical energy of the grapefruit at the top must equal the mechanical energy at the bottom, or if you want to say on the ground. Okay, now the mechanical energy at the top is made up of our initials. So we've got the initial kinetic energy plus the initial potential energy. And on the bottom where we have the finals, we've got the final kinetic energy plus the final potential energy. Now, let's think about this a moment. Let's look at the initials. Now we said 
that the gravitational potential energy is MGH, and we have an H, so we know we have a gravitational potential energy. But look at the speed. Right here at the top, right before it falls, it's not moving. And if it's not moving, it has no kinetic energy. So that term drops out because it's zero, okay? Now let's look at the final side. If we look down here on the ground, we know, oh, look, the final height is zero. And since potential energy depends on the height, if you have zero height, you have zero potential energy. Okay, so that drops out too. And you're left with the initial potential energy equals the final kinetic energy. And we have enough information to get the initial potential energy. So we can say KEF must equal the initial potential energy, which is MG h sub i, where g is the acceleration in free fall, okay? So now all I have to do is say 0.8 kilograms times 9.8 meters per second squared times 6 meters. Whoops, there we go, meters. And if you plug that in your calculator, and if you want to, go ahead and pause it right now and plug it in and see if you can get it and check it with mine, okay? All right, so if you plugged it into the calculator, okay, then you should know that the answer would be 47 joules of kinetic energy because that's what you had right up here. Remember, this is also the initial potential energy. So up here on the tree, it started out with 47 joules of potential energy. But as it fell, gravity did work to convert all 47 joules of potential energy into 47 joules of kinetic energy because we had no more potential energy once we reached the ground. So it all became kinetic. All right. See, that wasn't so bad, was it? Just sort of a little thought thing more than anything. All right. So now let's turn the page and let's look a little bit more at some of the different transformations of energy. And most of what we're looking at is kinetic. We'll get to other transformations in just a couple of minutes here. But look at this set of graphs. Now, this set of graphs is a classic um, in a, a classic representation of the energy of a swing or pendulum. Now, obviously, you guys are uh, have uh, back in elementary school, you guys played on swings and you swing back and forth, right? Now, a pendulum, if you remember, like a pendulum and a grandfather clock, it swings back and forth so that the clock keeps accurate time. Now, let's think about swinging back and forth. When a pendulum or a person on a swing goes back and forth, all right, there's a point on each side where he reaches a maximum height. Okay, so right here you have the maximum height, and that's going to give you your maximum potential energy. But that's also where you stop and change direction to go the other way. So your velocity has to be zero right there. So since you have minimum velocity, you also have the minimum kinetic energy. Okay, and that's shown right here. Now, notice this bar right here represents the total mechanical energy the person in swing have. Well, right here at this point or this point, whether you look at it as, as, um, uh, as, as this one is point A or this one is point A makes no difference. In that case, all of the mechanical energy is potential only. There is no kinetic energy because at that point, you're not moving. So the kinetic energy is zero. Now, let's look at another point. Let's look at a point where you're halfway down to the bottom, or if you will, halfway up to the top. Let's look at that point for a minute. Okay, now, if you're halfway up to the bottom, 
we're halfway down, uh, uh, halfway down to the bottom or halfway up to the top, that's going to be the point where the potential energy and kinetic energy are equal, okay? Because as you come down, your height decreases, so your potential energy decreases. But you begin to accelerate faster and faster, so your kinetic energy goes from zero to some value. And once you reach the halfway point, they should be the same. But the sum of the two should still be the same mechanical energy that you had before because it must be conserved. Now, let's look at the very bottom point, right when you reach the bottom. I keep using the wrong pen. Here we go. All right, so at the bottom point, now you have the minimum height, so you have the minimum potential energy or if you will, zero. Because where has it gone? Ah, oh, it's all gone to kinetic. Now you have the maximum speed, so you're going to have the maximum kinetic energy at that point, okay? But notice, the maximum kinetic energy is the same as the mechanical energy, just as the potential was over here. So through the swing, it gets switched. The potential energy decreases as you swing down. The kinetic energy increases until when you're at the bottom, you have your maximum. So energy is conserved. That works for a swing and for a pendulum too. Now, let's look at some projectile motion because we have talked quite a bit of projectile motion. Now here is a football uh, player kicking the football and you know it follows a lovely parabola shape. And if we look at some of these points right here, we can see that on the ground, whether at the beginning or at the end, the height is a minimum, it's zero. And therefore, your potential energy is a minimum. Likewise, at this point, all right, where it's first kicked, and right as it strikes the ground, you're going to have your fastest speed. That's where it's going to be moving the fastest. So you're going to have your maximum kinetic energy here. Now let's look at the point at the top. At this point, the ball has decelerated up. Vertically it stops. Now it's still moving horizontally, but vertically it stops. And then it starts accelerating back down. So here you have the minimum velocity, so you have the minimum kinetic energy. But your height is a maximum. So you have your maximum kinetic, uh, potential energy, sorry, maximum potential energy at that point, because it doesn't get any higher than that, so your maximum. In both of these cases, Notice that the mechanical energy must stay constant. It must be conserved. Okay? It must be conserved. All right, now let's look at other energy transformations. Yes, we can have kinetic energy being converted to potential and potential converted to kinetic but sometimes, in real life, our situations are not ideal. Sometimes, some of the kinetic and the potential energy are lost to other forms of energy through forces like friction, which produces heat. You know, when you rub your hands together, you feel heat. Well, that's from the friction. So some of the kinetic energy can be lost to heat. It can also be lost to sound. And it can be lost to air resistance, which is another way of uh, looking at friction. And it can also be lost to deformation. Deformation. Now let's look at that word a minute. Deform. What does deform mean? That means the object changes shape. And that takes energy energy that you cannot easily get back. So it's lost from your kinetic and potential sum, your mechanical. So let's first look at a ball bouncing. 
Now, just like with the football up here, the ball bouncing is going to exhibit an exchange or transformation between increasing potential energy and decreasing kinetic energy, and on the way down, decreasing potential energy, increasing kinetic energy, and then it strikes the floor. An interesting thing happens when it strikes the floor. Floor. If you could watch slow motion, you would see the ball deform. It will flatten slightly. And that takes energy, just like two cars crashing, all right? They really deform. So obviously, a lot of kinetic energy gets uh, converted to deformation in a car crash. But if you go online uh, onto YouTube and just um, uh, look for the keywords um, deformation of ball hitting floor, you can find a number of videos that show how a ball will flatten out as it hits the floor, and that takes energy. And then it will, as it comes up off the floor, it will reform again, taking some of that kinetic energy, which is why when it stops at the top to come back down again, it's not as high as it was before because you've lost some of your mechanical energy to other forms like deformation. And when a ball hits the floor, you get sound. Okay? And also, when it hits the floor, you get a little bit lost to friction. Okay, friction will produce a little heat when it hits the floor, and the heat is dissipated to the environment. But every time the ball hits the floor, it's going to deform and then pop back up. But now it doesn't have as much mechanical energy as it did before, so it won't go as high as it did before. In fact, guys, that's why on a roller coaster ride, typically the first big hill is the tallest because that's where you get all of the mechanical energy that's going to be used on the rest of the ride. And guess what? On the rest of the ride, some of that mechanical energy is lost to sound and to friction between the wheels and the rails. So each time it goes up another hill, it can't quite go up as high as it did before. So all of the hills are successively lower than the previous, okay? All right, now let's take a look at some other transformations that are not necessarily mechanical. Look at this one. Here in a light bulb, electricity goes into the bulb and it passes through a filament. This is what we call the filament, okay? And in fact, when a bulb blows, as many of you know, um, the filament breaks, and that's all that is. It just breaks and can't pass on the electric current because it's not a complete wire anymore. But how does it produce light? Well, as you know, <laughs> when things get really, really hot, they begin to glow, just like the eye on your stove. If you have an electric stove rather than a gas stove, the eye gets really hot, so it begins to glow. The same is true for fire. Um, the hottest part of a fire is the part that uh, glows blue-white, and uh, the cooler parts are the yellows, the oranges, and the reds. But the filament begins to glow from the heat of the electric current passing through it. That's producing light. But, as you know, it's also producing some heat. So the electric energy here, and I'm just going to say EE for electric energy, gets converted to both light and heat energy. Okay? Now, look at some of these other electrical transformations. In each of these cases, these are appliances we use in our home on a regular basis, and we're converting electric energy into other forms. Like on your stove, the electrical energy is transformed into heat to heat up our food. For a lamp, it mostly goes to light. Yes, there's a little bit of heat, but for right now, we're going to consider just the light part. 
a TV. You get two things from a TV. We get light from the screen, and we also get what? Oh, sound to show us what's happening. All right, so we get light and sound. A blender. With a blender, we get a lot of kinetic energy because it spins around and uh, uh, chops up the food for us, okay? It slices it up, so we get kinetic energy here, all right? So this is what appliances in our homes do. They take the electric energy and they simply convert it to other forms, okay? That's all they're doing and is just converting it to other forms. Now, let's take a look at chemical potential energy because this is commonly used. Batteries use chemical energy, which is a form of potential. A chemical reaction sets up a, an electric potential difference between positive and negative ends. And when they're connected, like in a, uh, an appliance or a device like a flashlight, when those are connected, you get an electric current. In this case, the electric current produced by this battery goes through the filament of the bulb and produces light energy or radiant electromagnetic energy. Okay? Over here, sunlight is um, uh, uh, sunlight on the leaves of plants. All right? The leaves use the light energy. by converting it to chemical energy which is stored. They store the chemical energy in the cells of the leaves. Okay, so you get light energy being converted into chemical potential energy. Another example of transforming a car engine takes chemical energy in the gasoline and transforms it into kinetic energy using the engine. The gas is, in, is injected into the um, piston uh, cylinders where the spark plugs cause an explosion of the gas. That's a chemical process. And the force of the explosion pushes the cylinders, all right, up, it pushes the pistons up and down inside the cylinders, which makes kinetic energy. And that's how our car moves. Um, right here, chemical energy, chemical energy from food that we eat is stored in our bodies. Our bodies can take uh, can take the chemical energy in the food and store it so that our muscles have it to use when we need to do work, okay? Now, an interesting thing about converting energy or transforming it from one form to another, and that is how fast we transform the energy. For example, I could pick up uh, uh, if... I could take a stack of books and take one book at a time and put it up on the shelf doing work. Or, and, and I'm converting uh, muscle energy, chemical energy in my muscles into potential energy for each book as I lift it up to the shelf. Or I could take all the books at once and lift them up to the shelf. Doesn't take as long if I do it that way. But that tells me something about the work that I've done. It tells me how fast I did it. And we call that power. Power is how fast energy is transformed or work is done. How fast work is done, okay? So there's two ways we can write this definition. We can say work divided by time, the rate of work done. That's how fast you do the work. Or we could also say it, since work is change in energy, we can say the change in energy, the energy transformed, how fast we're converting the energy in a time period. And that is power, okay? In fact, 
all of the electrical appliances that we've been looking at, if you go look on the labels on the devices where the specifics are, then you can see the power, the maximum power that each of the devices can generate. Now, how do we measure power? Well, it was first, uh, um, uh, power was first mathematically defined by a Scottish engineer named James, oh, look at this, James Watt. So we use a capital W at the end of the measure. So because he's the first one to understand how to calculate how fast energy is transformed or how fast work is done, we named the unit of power for him. A watt of power is a joule per second, okay? It's how many joules are converted every second or how many joules of work are done every second. That's the power generated. There is another unit for power, but we'll talk about it in a minute. All right, let's look now at the last page. Not very long. Let's look at an example of how we can determine the power of a particular device or a particular situation. Now, here is our power. Here is our power triangle. So, if you want to find the power, cover that up. Notice you have to take the energy or work and divide by the time. If you want to find the energy or work done, then you have to say power times time. And if you want to find the time the power was generated in, you can say energy divided by power, okay? So now, just remember, whichever one you want to find, cover it up with your finger to see what you have to do with the other two. Now, step one, first thing we're going to do is I read the problem and identify what we know. So it says, you transform 950 joules of chemical energy into mechanical energy. Oh, look, so you're going to do work to convert energy. So that's a change in energy. So if you took 950 joules of chemical energy and you converted it into mechanical energy, then the change in energy is 950 joules, isn't it? And it says here, it took you five seconds to do this as you pushed the sofa across the floor. Five seconds, that's all. And we want to know what's the power you generated when you did that. Okay, well, we want the power, so we cover up power. We have to say the change in energy divided by the time. So step two, let's write that out. The power equals the change in energy divided by the time. 